Well, it looks like we have 25 different people with us. And it's it is 32. Yeah, that's great. And it is 7.15, so I'm going to start uh, to introduce our speakers and then hand it over to them. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining Earthing Construction Initiative. We're a, a nonprofit organization that supports uh, earthing construction and supports and promotes earthing construction and the furthering of the science behind earthing construction um, to help make it um, more doable and available to everybody out there because it's something we all very strongly believe in from different different places and we have members on here from different states even from Me mexico joining us today and um yeah we're a membership organization so that's a, a big part of how we run so and our membership rates are, are pretty reasonable uh fifty dollars annually for um an at-large member there's a discounted membership of $25 available. There's a couple professional membership levels. Um, if you wanna join it at a higher rate and uh, as a corporate or as a, a perhaps a designer construction professional. Um, we have some t-shirts for sale that we made this year. Uh, nice, something we've been wanting to do for a while. And you know, this year we haven't been able to get together in person very much. Oh, at last year actually, happy new year everyone. So having matching t-shirts, um, and we've all worn them before on one of these meetings, so it, it's just a kind of a nice way to, to bond and bring everybody together. And we have those for sale. Um, I don't remember now if our sale price, uh, it, 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 it will be including shipping um, to the continental US, and I just don't remember if it's 20 or $25. Um, if you join as a member, you do get a, a free or included t-shirt with that. But if you'd like to buy any additional ones, it's either 20 or $25. So we'll clarify that forthcoming, but please let us know if you're interested. And uh, without further ado, um, we have one of our veteran speakers here and then a new speaker with us, um, Jim Halleck and then Antonio Madrid are here and they are going to be talking about a project that they are collaborating on or um, that uh, Jim helped make the blocks for and that Antonio is the developer behind it. It's the Hope Outdoor Gallery in Austin. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Let me know if you need anything techni technologically. Okay, take it Antonio. Appreciate it, Jim. Uh, thank you all for having me. Um, kind of quick background. I grew up in Austin, Texas. Um, went to University of Texas. I studied philosophy there and then you know, spent about 10 years trying to escape Austin. Um, and what ultimately brought me back is sort of getting pulled into the construction industry. So for the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been, <clears throat> I started out as a carpenter and then I started building, you know, kind of entertainment environments, bars and restaurants. And then was lucky enough to go to New York and, you know, do some you know, more artistic endeavors, installations. Uh, we saw an installation at the, on the rooftop of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, one at MoMA PS1, um, the Brooklyn Children's Museum, and, you know, a couple other pretty interesting projects. But, you know, I realized that, oddly enough, when I was doing some of the more interesting work in my life, I kind of missed Austin the most. And I miss Texas and I'm my family and my friends. So moved back to Austin about six years ago and, you know, with the intent of really trying to build the city I wanted to live in, you know, and stop chasing it. And, you know, so I kind of inserted myself into a lot of projects that I thought were culturally a bit more relevant and, you know, had more depth of meaning than just, you know, kind of hospitality and entertainment environments. So, you know, fast forward the next few years, you know, I kind of got involved with the Hope Outdoor Gallery, which is a very special environment here in town. Um, it basically, um, <clears throat> as well as a couple of other projects and community park spaces. Um, so, you know, it's been really lovely to be able to, you know, during with this project that I'm working on now bridge that gap between you know the types of projects and arts and programs that 
you know, I like promoting, but then simultaneously being able to do it in an architectural and constructive way that's more sustainable, you know, and ultimately I think more interesting. So I'm going to share my screen. And, you know, I prepared a little presentation just to give you all background on the Hope Outdoor Gallery and um, sort of what we're doing right now. Um, so let me know if this pops up for y'all. It did. Okay. Well. Okay. So the Hope Outdoor Gallery was a project started by what was called the Hope Campaign. Um, the Hope Campaign started in 2006 in LA um, by my partner and founder, Andy Skoll. Um, and the intent of that was to connect creatives with causes. So it was creating this platform by which creatives, whether they be artists, musicians, you know, architects, you know, could utilize their talents and utilize their skills to support, you know, nonprofit projects and humanitarian projects, you know, and other things like that. So one of the things that came out of that was it's called the Hope Outdoor Gallery, which opened here in Austin nine year, or in 2009. Um, and it kind of opened on a handshake deal with a person who owned a piece of property near downtown Austin which consisted of just a bunch of barren concrete walls, um, retaining walls, elevator shafts, you know, all the leftovers of a failed development project from 1981. So y'all would hate to hear this project. Um, so it was <clears throat> built a certain way. There was an engineer out of San Antonio um, who designed the foundation and the whole structure. And they ended up pouring it all building the whole structure and then there was a big rain that came through austin for about three four weeks everybody came back to the job site and all of the um foundations had shifted so they're scratching their heads trying to figure out what was wrong with it um they decided that it was bad concrete so they ripped it all out and then poured it back exactly the way it was designed previously built the structure on top, which was a six story condo, dried it in, put sheetrock on the walls, painted it all, you know, people were moving in and living there. Then one of these, another famous Texas goalie washer came through, rained for another three or four weeks. And after that, there were, the foundation shifted again and there were holes big enough in the sheetrock that people could stick their heads through it. So needless to say, they took down the development they tore down all the top floors and just left the concrete walls, which basically sat bare and kind of vacant for, you know, the last 30 years. So 2009, uh, my friend Andy just asked the property owner if she could bring some artists out to paint some murals, you know, and kind of practice their art. And over the ensuing nine years, it just became this beautiful visual open mic for the city of Austin the top tourist attraction for the city of Austin, and just a gathering place for all sorts of people. You know, you know, it's sort of demographically one of the most diverse environments. Um, so over the years, people would just reach out to us for all sorts of activities, you know, whether it be photo shoots or weddings, field trips, you know, we'd have Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops there just kind of cleaning up on the weekends we'd have sort of families come in and picnic on a day. Um, so it really is something that kind of appealed and kind of made sense for a lot of people. I think in large part because it was this semi unregulated property that where people were just allowed to create and just be. So as part of that, we also were reached out to by a bunch of film and production activities. You know, we were able to make relationships with people from all industries so whether they were you know in the film industry or in schools you know on a, on a weekly basis like middle schools colleges 
you know, pro arts programs from all around Central Texas would reach out to us to see if we could do classes for them for painting or, you know, kind of, you know, show them, you know, talk, talk to them about the art that was there, um, which, you know, kind of was never something that we intended for the project, but it just happened really naturally. And, you know, so, you know, at its peak, we were seeing 50 to 200 people per day going through the old site. On weekends, there would be about 3,000 to 5,000 people per day just kind of showing up there, you know, and it's anywhere from, you know, people in high heels taking, you know, prom photos to, you know, kind of break dancers to people doing parkour to yoga to musicians who would set up. You know, so it really became this like beautiful visual open mic for the city or just kind of a place for free expression um, that a lot of people gravitated towards. So this is a quote um, by one of the founding members of Hope. His name is Shepard Ferry. Um, Y'all might recognize him from Obama's Hope poster. He also was the first street artist and mural artist to have a painting of a president in the portrait gallery. Um, but he is also a very big supporter of this project and understands like the power of its ability to just bring people together and allow them to explore. <clears throat> However, you know, we always knew that original site was limited and that it was always a handshake deal, six months that turned into nine years. Um, but actually for the last six years of my life, I've been looking for a new location for it to have a new life. And under the, we had kind of searched for that new location under our, you know, sort of this notion of these walls bring us together. So it was sort of a marketing campaign that we had to kind of describe what we wanted to do next and how we wanted to position the park and its activities within our community. So of course, as y'all can imagine, our goal was to open this year at some point before the election. <laughs> and you know kind of show people and kind of have people gather in a more positive more positive light than we all have been lately however i think the the notion of what we're trying to do there is still pertinent and always will be um, so this is a design for the new hope outdoor gallery which sits on a 17.7 acre piece of land that we were able to purchase where we are beginning to create not only walls for painting and murals but also an environment where we can do more educational programming have art gallery space workshop space for artists um you know and at the topic of our conversation here is sort of start talking about sustainability initiatives that we're kind of incorporating into the park and hopefully be able to teach people a little bit more about those things in a way that's very accessible to the public. Um, so what's beautiful about this design and the reason for its impetus was that it sits under two flight paths directly into the airport. So every three minutes, um, there's an American Airlines flight or a Southwest Airlines or United flight that goes directly over this. So half of the people traveling to Austin see the word hope as they arrive. So that was a sort of a three acre park is where we're starting, but really what we're trying to do as an organization, hope started out as a nonprofit which now, <clears throat> which does educational programming, you know, really a lot of what we were doing is connecting, you know, helping artists become full-time artists. You know, at the same time, as y'all can imagine, being a nonprofit is just a very difficult thing to sustain financially. And it's a very difficult thing to do over time. So, 
you know, really the way we've concepted the New Hope Outdoor Gallery is by creating a revenue model through doing events, doing art shows, you know, selling, you know, merchandise, coffee, spray paint, various other things like that, that will effectually fund our nonprofit educational activities. So, so the H is just kind of, the majority of the park is just open air. Um, this is a big 14,000 square foot plaza. Um, all of the walls of which will be curated artworks from not only local artists and people from Central Texas, but people from all around the world. You know, and one major benefit of what we've designed is really taking the learnings of the last nine years of the project and being able to accommodate a lot of the things that, you know, effectively were, you know, kind of voided because of its popularity. So here we're getting back to the ability to, you know, really foster artistic talent, you know, have wall space that people know they can utilize, nobody's going to tag or paint over it. Um, and they have more time and more space and more safety to do so. So, so the O is, you know, sort of another outdoor space, but it's connected to an interior little restaurant space. Um, you know, the dimensions are a little deceiving. So the O actually, um, Jim and I found out that I made it a little bit bigger than it was supposed to be. So it's actually about 11,000 square feet. Um, so again, it's just another outdoor space for families to come to, for artists to paint. Um, but it also doubles as an environment for events for educational programming, for comedy nights, for you know other reasons to gather beyond just um, the murals and the paint and all that sort of stuff. So the O again, <clears throat> there's a building with a rooftop on it. So what's really kind of breathtaking about it is that you know you can kind of take in in panorama not only you know, everything that's happening there, but, you know, the site is situated really beautifully where, you know, you get to see the full spectrum of the sunrise to sunset um, and is surrounded by cow pastures and, you know, mines. <laughs> so it, it actually has kind of a very, I don't know, oddball type feel to it, which is really beautiful. Um, so the P, you know, and this kind of gets to sort of the complexity and really the, you know, richness of the project. So the HOPE campaign has always been made up of creatives of all types. So we were actually, this location was actually just named the location for the Olympic, U.S. Olympic trials for breakdancing. And july of 2021 so the first time that break dancing will ever be in the olympics is ostensibly 2024 so you know our ties with you know the hip-hop community with the dance community with bmx with skateboarding you know all of that you know is intended to be you know make up the fabric of what we're doing in this place you know, and all of that is intended to, you know, give people an opportunity to experience activities and, you know, ways of thinking that, you know, really aren't on display or that accessible here around Austin. So the E, so this is, uh, the E portion is something that's coming later down the line. We call it phase three. Um, but the goal over time after we get the rest of the park open is to be able to open up more gallery space, office space for nonprofits, space for people who are in the entertainment industry, whether that be making music, whether that be um, producing, you know, as well as gallery space and, you know, artist workshop environments. So it's kind of a pie in the sky idea, but I figured I'd just show you all just so you kind of understand, you know, sort of the 
the breadth of the project. Um, and then, so that kind of brings us to, and I'm, I'm a terrible speaker. I apologize if any of y'all are bored, but uh, sort of what's kind of more pertinent to our conversation tonight. Um, so we've, you know, take, made a concerted effort to try to introduce and, you know, implement some sustainable practices, you know, in our environment, in the environment that we're building. And so, as y'all know, using earth and construction is one of them, but I also wanted to highlight a few other areas where, you know, we're trying to kind of create an environment that one is more sustainable but two, we can utilize as a plat as an educational platform for, you know, through this mechanism of hope that's a little bit more generally accessible to the public. So one thing we're doing, we we're able to get a, a bunch of solar panels donated by First Solar. Um, they're really beautiful. Um, and I'm currently working with Tesla to get some Tesla battery packs. And we will ultimately have 115 kW solar array, which will, is enough power to power the whole park as we have it envisioned currently. Um, you know, I'm also bringing in utilities from the city, but you know, we're trying to be as off grid as we can. <laughs> um, so rainwater capture. So we're starting with a 30,000 gallon tank um, that's just capturing rain from our rooftop deck. Um, and that'll, that'll be utilized for all of our gray water. As you can imagine with a park this size, there'll be at any given time, potentially thousands of people there. Um, so that equals to a lot of bathrooms. Um, but luckily the calculations work out that we should be able to supply the majority of that utilizing rainwater capture for our gray water, for our gray water. Um, and another initiative we're doing is <clears throat> the old park is slated to be demolished. So the new developer is actually having to remove all of the concrete, the thousands of linear feet of concrete walls, all of the retaining walls, all of the footers, all of the piers, and then build a new structure from scratch. So we've worked out a deal with that developer to bring all of that debris to our site where we will crush it and utilize the fines or the materials that we get out of that for our driveway substrates, our walking paths, our parking spaces and all that. So kind of the goal is to really bring this whole project full circle, you know, and really, you know, tie it to what came before, which is so important and really has kind of breathed the life into us being able to do this now. So, as I mentioned, one of those initiatives was to utilize compressed earth. I, I say brick here, uh, a lot of people say block. Um, but to utilize compressed earth brick in the construction of the thousand linear feet of wall that we're building. So, this idea, you know, oddly enough, came while I was early on in the construction. Like I didn't know anything about earth and construction, period. Um, and I was out there just kind of by myself with a small crew and we were starting to drill piers. So I ended up drilling 95 piers that are two foot diameter all the way down to bedrock. And those I filled with about 1500 pounds or how many, I, I forgot, I've forgotten the number, but $2,500 worth of concrete and steel. And I did that 95 times over. And then we ended up pouring um, grade beams and that were 30 inch by 30 inch with you know, sort of, as you can imagine, hundreds and hundreds of yards of concrete. And that's what this whole, all these structures sit on. But 
that whole time I was just kind of sickened by the process actually. Um, so, you know, I started kind of trying to figure out whether there was something else that I could do or another way to kind of build the rest of the park that would be a little bit more, you know, ecologically, I don't know, kind. Um, and, you know, a lot of that spawned from the reason we needed to do the foundation that we did was that the whole site that we're on actually is a large fill site. So it's 17.7 .7 acres total. At one time, it was all sandy loam, but it was also owned by Jimmy Evans, which is a big construction company who does site work all across Central Texas. Um, and what they did, they, they got the contract to grade the F1 track here in Austin. And what they did to grade it was dig all of the sandy loam out of this site, 35 feet down to bedrock, all 17 and a half acres. And they transported all of that dirt five miles down the road. And then over the ensuing 20 years, they filled up this whole property with debris from construction sites around Central Texas. So whether it was golf courses or high rises or mixed use developments or malls. So, and then after they filled it all up, they gave it to us. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I kind of didn't want that fact to be a negative thing for the project or a negative thing for the construction of it. So I started wondering if there was actually, you know, although we had to do these massive foundations, if there was some way to utilize, you know, the land. Um, and we're really luckily positioned, or, you know, very close to a bunch of mine, mining sites as well. So I started doing some online research. You know, one of the first people I came across was Ron Evans from De La Tierra, and I had this wild idea to make all our walls out of rammed earth. <laughs> so um, that's the architect in me. Um, but of course, had a few conversations with him and realized that the cost would just be exorbitant. And sort of started falling down the rabbit hole more and more. He suggested I talk to a guy named Ryan Rungi, um, who was making compressed earth block down in San Antonio. So I took a trip down there and kind of met him and talked about equipment and talked about what the process would look like. And, you know, as we move things along, he suggested I talk to another guy, a guy named Jim Halley. And, you know, that's when really, you know, that was about nine months worth of work to get to that point. And that's really when the project started taking off and where, where it really started, you know, kind of getting some meat on the bone. So it turned from an idea to, to something that was really possible. So anyways, we all met up, you know, early last year and, you know, started the process by which over the summertime, we pressed 40,000 earth brick at the Hope Outdoor Gallery site. Um, and that is enough to build all the walls for the H portion and the O portion of the project. Um, Jim and Ryan partnered on the process by which we did that on site and I'll let them talk more about that later. Um, but they brought the machines, they brought the know-how and kind of taught my guys how to do it. Um, you know, from a transportation standpoint, from a carbon dioxide emission standpoint, we we're very lucky to be surrounded by sites that had the type of soils and the type of decomposed granite and sand that we needed to kind of make um, the bricks very efficiently. And, you know, come to find out what we were pressing out there was, you know, as, as Jim would say, record-breaking bricks. So with 6% Portland cement, and then a mix of a lot of good stuff, um, we were able to make bricks that are as strong, if not stronger than cinder blocks concrete filled cinder block. And just a month ago, we started going vertical. <laughs> so to date, we've laid about 500 linear feet of wall. 
um, of a total thousand linear feet. So they're 24 inch thick walls that are double wide and we're making them out of 10 inch by 14 inch by three and a half inch thick block. Um, so the structural engineers that I was working with, they wanted to refer to some code um, for how we built it all and sort of the structural elements and how it all tied together. So, you know, luckily they were extremely, extremely receptive to the idea of using earth block. Um, and they ultimately settled on utilizing the code that's used in New Mexico, um, which, you know, to my understanding says that a freestanding CEB wall can be, you know, 12 feet tall and then it needs some sort of bond beam or something else to kind of break it up before you can go higher, um, which kind of dictates how we did this construction. So I had a CMU stem wall that ultimately will sit about three feet above grade, finished grade, and then a 12 foot C uh, compressed earth block wall capped by a one foot thick bond beam. So, you know, from a, you know, unlike CMU and unlike sort of a concrete poured wall, you know, this compressed earth block wall, because of its mass and density, didn't require any rebar or further concrete added to it. And the mortar mix was made with the same material as we made the brick. Well, that's my last slide. <laughs> um, so without further ado, I was going to pass it on to Jim and Ryan to kind of, you know, talk a little bit more about, you know, any technical things. And then obviously, you know, I'd love to hear your questions afterward. All right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll take it from here. I just, I just want to say, as you can all see that I feel, and I know Ryan does too, very privileged to be involved in this visionary project. And, um, um, I feel lucky to have met uh, Antonio Madrid. And I want to thank ECI and particularly uh, Ron Evans for that open door. And I never would have met Antonio uh, otherwise. But uh, I came up from Mexico to talk to him about it. I was blown away by the whole vision. I mean, acres and acres of footings and trenches and, you know, 25 deep holes. <laughs> It's uh, it just incredible, and I, I want to be a part of it. But in the conversation, um, Antonio, this is pre-COVID, and everything was going to run like clockwork, right? We were going to go real fast. And uh, so one of Antonio's words was, I want this to be seamless. Seamless. I said to myself, seamless. I have, uh, I have very good equipment, but it's very old equipment, and I've, it sometimes needs work. Um, and so seamless was a little, <clears throat> little nerve wracking. And, and that uh, sent me off quickly to uh, Ryan, who already knew about the project and knew Antonio. And I said, if we do this together, we'll have two of everything. And we can be close to seamless. And, and we were uh, pretty much. Uh, had a few breakdowns where Ryan had somebody up there from AECT to fix it either the same day or the next day. And, and it went real well. I have to say, I don't know if Miles is on the call or not, but Miles Starkey was uh, Antonio's guy driving the crew out there to make the blocks. And wow, I mean, day after day after day of thousands and thousands of blocks. And it was hot, real hot. And uh, those guys stuck with it and uh, they made diamond blocks. We uh, had them crushed at PSI in San Antonio. And we averaged about 2,800 PSI on these blocks. They were amazing uh, record setters. They were for me. Um, and Antonio mentioned the quarries that are right next to the project. And I had uh, secured soil from one of those quarries, Marcellos, uh, years ago to do um, Becky's house in Austin. But I went back there and, you know, they, the, this was years later and things move around and they really didn't have, um, what they had didn't have enough high, high enough clay content. So I ended up at another quarry where they had high clay content and then we had that trucked over. Fortunately, it was only less than a mile away to the quarry that had uh, sand and DG, decomposed gravel, and a screener 
and they agreed to mix the soil from the first plant with their sand DG and deliver it to us. So that's, that's how it went. And boy, it worked. Um, <laughs> it, it really worked. So um, the, um, when, I, when I first got out there, there was a question about whether we could paint these blocks or not, because uh, earth blocks tend to absorb paint. So we had a discussion about whether that was possible or not. And I suggested, I don't know if I'm allowed to, you know, name a particular product on here or not. But, uh, but uh, anyway, some penetrating water stop that I've become very fond of. And so we put that on, on a block and had Miles, who is a spray painter, uh, shoot it. And uh, it, uh, it worked. This is kind of the, the initial block of... Uh, hope project right here it now adorns the mantle of my fireplace um but i volunteered to donate it to the entryway anyway um then uh, so ryan and i did this and the whole time we're talking about gee you know if we had a block plant we could uh we wouldn't have to worry about the weather or machinery break down we just have piles of blocks on the truck here they come and um we uh, agreed pretty quickly that was a good idea, and that's what launched uh, Texaterra, which is our our mutual block plant right behind Ryan's factory in, in San Antonio. We've got plenty of room. We combine our equipment. We've got lots of equipment. We'll ultimately be able to make about seven different blocks uh, with the machinery, the different machinery that we have. So uh, it's it, we're both real excited about springtime. And um, we shipped out our first order of blocks last month to uh, Dallas. So um, our common purpose, uh, Ryan's and mine, and, and our complementary talents, uh, uh, really, and our combination on the Hope Project uh, has really been the things that brought uh, Texaterra together. So... Well, I'm happy about the whole thing, and look at those walls, man! Oh, man! Ryan, are you on there? You want to jump in? Uh, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm. I don't. I guess I'm not on video, but that's probably fine. Um, yeah. That. That's. I mean, that's pretty much it. They, I think. Um, we just realized there's a lot of efficiencies to. I mean, Antonio had to go. Had to, had to learn the. Um, the pitfalls of kind of starting from scratch and with equipment and people and training and. Uh, sourcing soil and all that stuff and I mean uh, he told us how much he was in f per block and <laughs> it, it, it it's it, you know half of that's probably kind of the ramp up and we realized man if you could get if you could just do that ramp up one time and make it at a make the blocks at a central location um, and then ship them from there you you know you'll make out cost wise um, in the end and so so yeah it's all it's uh it's been